Okay, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Tim Swindle. I'm the director of the Lunar and Planetary Lab. I want to welcome all of you. I want to thank you for braving the parking conditions to uh, get here. Just a couple of announcements before we get started. One, if you are a student and need uh, your notes stamped, we have people outside who will do that afterwards. Don't come up here because I don't have the official stamp. Um, nor, nor does Travis. Um, also, this is the last of our public lectures for this semester. Um, I don't know, is the Steward Lecture Series over? Uh, they're still running, right? On, is the next one the Monday after Thanksgiving? Next, next Monday, Monday. okay, yeah. Um, and then also, next semester, we always do these just in the fall. But in the spring, one of the reasons we do that is because in the spring, the College of Science has its lecture series, seven Monday nights starting on January 26th. And the topic this time is life in the universe. And so there will be a number of people who have spoken here who will be uh, giving presentations there. That's at Centennial Hall. And if you want to go, uh, come early because Centennial Hall will fill. Um, and I don't think there were any other announcements I needed to make. So uh, tonight's speaker is Dr. Travis Marmon, who is a professor in the Lunar and Planetary Lab. Travis uh, got his bachelor's and PhD in physics at the University of Georgia, then went off and did uh, postdocs at Wichita State, Wichita, Kansas, and UCLA, comparable institutions, of course, and then uh, spent about seven years at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff before we lured him down here a year and a half ago, right? Yeah, roughly that. Yeah, something like a year and a half ago. And so Travis and I will be talking about imaging exoplanets. Great. Uh, can you guys hear me still? Is this still working? Okay. Uh, thanks, Tim, for the introduction. And thank you all. I'll repeat Tim's uh, uh, gratitude for braving the parking conditions. I, Hopefully, I'm not going to get a parking ticket. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if I parked in a legitimate uh, spot. Um, and uh, I guess you're not all basketball fans, because apparently there's a basketball game going on. And uh, I'm pretty cer certain that it's uh, not the University of Georgia versus the University of Arizona. So I'm not the enemy, <laughs> even though I came from the University of Georgia. Uh, as Tim said, uh, I will be talking about imaging exoplanets. This is work that uh, I've been involved with uh, for a number of years now, um, almost a decade. Well, exactly a decade, uh, as of last October, in fact. Um, so what I show here is a, is a picture. Uh, it looks like any, any other image of a star in the sky that you might see. Uh, you, you can Google this particular star, which I will be talking a lot about. And you might find an image that, like, that looks like this. And you can see that it's quite bright. Uh, there's a halo of scattered light around it. and a very intense uh, region of bright light um, near the center. And uh, this, is not the na this is not the shape of that star. We, this is not an image of the star's shape or its surface or anything like that. This is just showing uh, scattered light, and it's concentrated in a, a region near the position of the star. And the shape of that is uh, related to the optics, the telescope, and so forth that took this image. And then there's another bright star that's near it. There, the, it's not a companion uh, to that star. It's actually just a chance alignment of another bright star in the sky. Um, and then you see a bunch of faint other stars in the region. And this particular star has at least four planets orbiting it. Can you see them? You can't see them. Uh, the separation of this uh, these two stars, right now they're not bound, but the separation on the sky is about one arc minute. Now, an arc minute, there are 60 um, arc minutes in a degree. And for reference, the full moon is about a half a degree in size. And so about 30 arc minutes. And so uh, 30 times the separation, if you were to imagine the full moon, it would completely cover uh, this, uh, this image here. And so that's uh, already a fairly small separation on the sky, just the separation between it relative to something you're familiar with, like the moon, the diameter of the moon on the sky. The four planets that orbit this star are well within uh, that space. And I'll try to I'll, I'll illustrate how small that uh, region is uh, in a little bit. But the challenge is to take all this scattered light 
and remove it without also removing the light coming from the planets themselves. And so that's what I mean by imaging planets, separating their light from the starlight, as opposed to other techniques that uh, infer the presence of planets in an indirect way, either because the star is wobbling on the sky, because a planet is orbiting it and tugging on it, or perhaps in these chance alignments where the planetary system, uh, we're seeing it edge on from the Earth, and occasionally a, star pass the, a planet passes in front of the star, dimming the light periodically, which we call a transiting planet. And those are indirect techniques. By direct, we need to figure out a way to zoom in on a region tinier than that, that laser pointer, separate the starlight, and leave the planet light. That's the challenge. Now, when imaging planets, I hope you weren't uh, misled into thinking we're going to resolve surface features on the planet, see continents or anything like that, clouds. We're not there yet. Um, but for some surface features, like dark spots and bright spots on giant planets, we're not that far away from that, actually. OK, so this is, that, uh, this is the same star. Uh, I, I'm just going to show you that one of the exciting images right away. Um, that's the same star, this one right here. And this uh, separation is, is uh, an arc minute or one, uh, one thirtieth of the diameter of the moon. And now, that's the same star now I've used it. There's been a, a clever process that I'm going to describe how it works uh, through the course of the talk uh, to remove the starlight and reveal those four planets. And the scale we're talking about here is half an arc second. Remember, there's 60 arc seconds in one minute. And, uh, and for the, the, it just so happens I, grabbed this, I found this book on my shelf that's about the thickness of my thumb. And when I hold my thumb up in the sky, I have a small thumb. So it's not exactly the size of the moon on the sky, but almost. And so my book, held at arm's length, is about the thickness of the moon on the sky. And if I take one page out of this book, make sure I get just one, because it, oh, yeah, there's two stuck together. Just one held at arm's length. The thickness of that piece of paper uh, is, is four times one arc second, or eight times this little scale bar. So this, uh, the separation of this planet with that star is less than the thickness of one sheet of paper held on the sky. So if you were to go back to this one, imagine seeing that star on the sky and saying, I need to resolve individual planets thinner than the thickness of a sheet of paper and do it in a way that, uh, th that suppresses the starlight and keeps the planet light. I hope that impresses you, because if you, hold, you should totally hold a piece of paper up. It's very thin, actually. Uh, it's quite remarkable. And you'll see we do even better than that uh, with modern telescopes. Um, so it's almost finer than a frog's hair, as we say in the South. So if you, uh, you can, you know, these are the four planets around that star. There might be more uh, if, you, you know, if you developed better techniques, better instrumentation. Which, will be, which I'll talk about at the end of the talk, ways to look even closer into the star and perhaps find a fifth or sixth planet. OK, so how do we, how do, we do this uh, and why? And, uh, and why? Uh, we'll go through that. OK, so uh, the one question you might ask yourself is, uh, especially if you've been paying attention uh, to um, planets around other stars very recently, there's been a great um, uh, increase in the discovery of planets around other stars. And this is a graph showing the number of planets from 0 up to 800. And then year of discovery, the first planet around a sun-like star was found in 1995 around a star named 51 Pegasus, a star in, in the constellation Pegasus. And so there's one little, one little bar there. And then as the year went along, uh, uh, the number of discoveries increased. And most of these were found by the radial velocity technique, which is a way of measuring the precise velocity of a star. And that velocity changes on a, on a regular period, very tiny amount, uh, comparable to the speed I'm walking right now, sort of back and forth, uh, kind of meters per second or a few hundred meters per second, a good jog or sprint. Um, and that technique was, was very efficient at finding stars. Uh, most of these in the blue bar uh, were found that way. And then um, 
Recently, there was a space mission named after Kepler uh, called the Kepler Space Mission, which stared at a patch of the sky at hundreds of thousands of stars and found uh, a, a huge number of planets. And just earlier this year, in February of 2014, they released uh, hundreds of their new discoveries. And so you might, you know, if you heard about Kepler, and Kepler's results are very impressive, they tell us that nearly every star has a planetary system. One in six planets have an Earth, uh, stars have an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone where water, liquid water could survive. Very impressive results. And so you might say, why bother? Why should I bother imaging planets? Because I'm not resolving surface features. I'm just finding planets in a different way by separating their starlight. Why bother? Because Kepler, maybe Kepler told us all the answers, right? Well, that's not the case um, because Kepler is looking for planets in this particular chance alignment. Now, planetary systems should be randomly oriented in uh, space, in the, ga in the galaxy. Um, and so a fraction of those, a small fraction of those, will line up with the Earth. And so when we observe them, we will periodically see their, the light of the star decrease as the planet blocks it for a few hours or a few, can be a few days even for uh, uh, long periods. And so um, that the chance of finding, the probability of finding a planet uh, in that chance alignment depends on the size of the star and the separation of the planet from the star. And so that technique is biased to you know, big size stars and, and planets that are close in. And so Kepler, uh, and Kepler also uh, has, has had a malfunction. It can't continue to point at the same piece of the sky. It's starting to drift off of that patch of sky. And so it's really only sensitive to planets with periods less than 100 days. Of course, the Earth is uh, 365 days, and so Kepler uh, can't find an Earth analog, for starters. It can't find a Jupiter analog, Uranus or Neptune. So transiting planets are, are, are biased towards uh, small separations. Here's the Earth-Sun distance for reference, a tenth. Remember, Mercury is about three-tenths of an astronomical unit. The Earth-Sun distance, I might use AUs frequently, so that's the Earth-Sun uh, distance, one AU. And this is mass relative to Jupiter. So Earth is down here. Um, this is, um, Solar system planets are over here. This is a legend for reference. So transiting planets favor planets in short uh, orbital periods, so small separations relative to their star. And, uh, and then this just shows the range of probable masses that Kepler has found. Very, it's found very small stars, comparable to, uh, st small planets comparable to the size of the Earth on up to objects the size of Jupiter. But because of that roughly 100-day um, period limit, it won't find planets out here at larger separations comparable to where Jupiter, Uranus, uh, and Neptune are located, or even, or even the Earth. These small dots are the positions of discoveries by that radial velocity technique, so those little blue histograms over the course of time. Uh, and then out here I'm showing uh, those four planets that were found by direct imaging uh, that I showed you before. Those are shown by the red stars, and those are at separations of tens to hundreds of, a, uh, of AU, uh, so comparable to, um, to our solar system planets. And then there are a few other dots on here which just show uh, roughly where um, current modern techniques for imaging planets are sensitive to. It's biased to finding things at wide separations, and I'll explain why, uh, but also uh, to things that are higher mass, because higher mass planets, um, more massive than Jupiter, are generally brighter, and so brighter things are easier to detect. It's easier to separate the light from the host star if the planet itself is brighter. So direct imaging will find objects up here. Now, it just so happens that planets that are in this particular orientation, uh, in this transiting geometry edge on, and planets at wide separations that are also brighter are easier to characterize. So both groups of planets are very interesting if you want to study their atmospheres. Uh, learn about the compositions of their atmospheres, uh, determine something about their densities, uh, those kinds of things. Planets in the middle here are difficult uh, to, to do because we can't, we can't separate their star, the planet light from the starlight very easily. Um, uh, so we're really restricted to planets in, this, in this, these two regions. So by imaging planets, I find planets in a region other uh, techniques are not sensitive to. The radial velocity technique is also limited uh, 
to orbital long to short orbital periods. Typically, astronomers have to survey a, observe a star for many years to see that Doppler wobble for long periods. If the period's five years, then you need to observe it for five years. You don't have to observe it continuously, but you need measurements throughout that five-year period to see the one complete um, uh, orbit. And so uh, if you're an astronomer like me, uh, I don't anticipate living for a couple of hundred years. And so finding planets uh, on orbital periods of over 100 years, uh, I, I, I don't, and I'm, you know, I exercise and eat right, but uh, that's not going to get me there. So if I want to find planets in uh, separations comparable to our own giant planets, direct imaging is really the only way, uh, really the best way to do it. Okay, so other motivations. So we want to find uh, how many and how often giant planets form at wide separations. Kepler has not told us that. Even though it's provided thousands of planets, it has not told us how uh, frequently and how many um, giant planets exist at separations comparable to our own. We want to study planetary systems similar to ours so we understand our own origins. If we only find planets that are, have periods less than 100 days, that's not going to help us. Um, because the giant planets played a very important role in sculpting the, the state of our solar system today, where the comets are located, the asteroid belts, properties, um, and so on. So we, don't, we haven't answered this question yet. So what do giant planets look like at young ages? I've mentioned already that they're brighter. Um, they're brighter for two reasons. This is a little silly cartoon that I made. This shows time and year, so a million years over here. And then the age of, the, uh, age of the sun is over here, several billion years. And a giant planet, when it's first born, is generally larger and hotter. I'm just showing you the size. This little simple cartoon shows the size. So this is 1.8 times the radius of Jupiter. And then it falls down. And this just shows a tick mark of a, of a known, giant, known giant planet. And it starts off bigger. And it's also much hotter. Bigger plus hotter means more luminous. And so at the age of the sun, uh, a typical gi uh, giant planet like Jupiter would be a billion times fainter than the sun. But if I turned the clock back and looked at the, our, if an alien looked at our solar system uh, millions of years ago, then Jupiter would have been roughly 100,000 times fainter than the sun. 100,000 times fainter is still faint, but it's not as bad as a billion times fainter. <laughs> so, so, um, uh, yeah, so younger uh, equals larger and hotter. And so if we start to image planets uh, uh, around young stars, we can start to understand how they looked uh, at early ages. So that brings me to the next motivation, understand the early evolution of giant planets and the dominant formation mechanisms. Um, the technique of direct imaging is more sensitive to brighter uh, planets. And so we're going to game the system a little bit by focusing on young stars. I'll come back to this uh, in a few minutes. OK, another thing, uh, we all, you know, we've seen uh, pictures of Saturn uh, and Jupiter, and they have beautiful atmospheres that show, for Jupiter, for example, shows different bands, uh, seeing different types of clouds, uh, and the great red spot, this giant uh, long-lived storm. Uh, and we would love to sort of understand what Jupiter looked like when it was a few hundred million years old. What, was the weather the same then? Uh, probably not. Uh, its temperatures were much higher. Uh, its size was bigger. Um, and so this plot shows uh, surface gravity. So that's the thing that you feel, you know, you get on a scale. Um, surface gravity of the Earth uh, sets what your weight would register. And so different surface gravities produce different effects in planetary atmospheres and also temperature. And all these dots uh, show where most planets, uh, the ones in the bar graphs and the Kepler diagram, would fall in terms of different surface gravity. For reference, the Earth's surface gravity is, it was down here. These are the Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus sit here. And their temperatures you know, are close to 100 Kelvin. Most of the objects we've found are often the transiting planets. Remember I told you that you're more likely to find a planet uh, in this edge-on configuration for planets that orbit close to their star. Closer to the star means a hotter planet, because it's being irradiated more. And so those are, a lot of those are shown here in open uh, symbols. They're very hot, often over 1,000 Kelvin. Uh, these are near the melting points of things like lead, iron, and so forth. So it's very high temperatures. If we want to get to, um, we really want to understand how other planets, like Jupiter, Uranus, um, and Saturn look like, 
we have, we have kind of a ways to go. We need to push to lower temperatures um, and uh, characterize their atmospheres. And we're not there yet. This gray box shows the current state of the art uh, for different uh, instruments that can image, that are capable of imaging planets. And they get us closer, but still not there. Um, so, but still opens the door. These are uh, stars and then brown, brown dwarfs, which aren't quite stars. And so if you're curious where stars lie, they're up over in this part of the diagram. So that's the next motivation. We want to expand the range of giant planet atmospheres that we want to study, and that we can study and observe their long-term evolution. By looking at young stars and, and giant planets, we can understand what their atmospheres were like at early times. And then we can infer something about how Jupiter looked when it was younger. OK, so that's the, that's the, that's the why bother part. Uh, I hope I convinced you that's worthwhile. Kepler didn't, didn't uh, steal my thunder. It didn't answer the questions that I just posed. Um, so there's a lot of work to do. So now, how do you do it? I showed you that image of the star. And then the next one was zooming in at the sort of frog's hair resolution scale. And you could see those um, planets very easily. But how did I get from that to between those two images? There's a lot of work. Um, and so I'll, I'll go through how that, how that process works. And if you're really wealthy, you can do this yourself. It's kind of expensive. <laughs> OK, so I already sort of already gave you a bit of the clue. Uh, so uh, direct imaging is possible. It's very possible if we focus, if we just ignore old stars and only look at young stars. And so this is the typical age range for direct imaging targets, uh, uh, tens of millions of years out to a few hundred million years. We don't look at stars as old as the sun. Sometimes we accidentally look at stars as old as the sun because we thought they were young. And uh, sometimes it's not easy. Stars don't have uh, easy, um, really easy characteristics for determining their ages. Um, there are some, but uh, it takes a lot of detective work to get uh, a star's age in most cases. So we try to focus on um, uh, stars that are tens of millions of years, because uh, we want planets to have time to form. Uh, we don't want to look at the ones that are too young. Um, and then we don't want to get too old. And this is just showing you that change in brightness. So we're looking at things that are much brighter than, than Jupiter would be today um, and trying to take advantage of this hundreds of thousands of times fainter versus a billion times fainter. The other thing we do is we look at uh, stars that are near, closer to the Earth for two reasons. Um, if you have, so this is just a simple cartoon. Here's a star and the Earth is to, your, to the left. And uh, let's imagine that there's a planet. Let's say you're seeing the, the planetary system face on. You don't always see them face on, but, uh, um, but let's pretend. And then this planet is, a, is one uh, astronomical unit, so one uh, Earth-Sun distance away from its star. And at 32.6 light years, uh, um, that is about 10 arc seconds in the sky. So a little over two, two sheets of paper. If I push the star farther away, uh, then, and, the, and the planet's still the same distance, then its projected separation on the sky shrinks. So this is, you can convince yourself of this if you've ever uh, looked at something very far away and you've wondered, well, is that one person or two person? I can't really tell. And you, you, you know, jog over there and suddenly you can see that it's two people or just one person, right? You know, two trees on the horizon, you may not be able to resolve them as two trees, but if you get sand right in front of them, clearly they're two trees. <laughs> Uh, so the farther away, their angular separation decreases. And so if you focus uh, on stars that are near the Earth, then that increases their angular separation on the sky. It's still, you know, still very thin. It's very, still very small. We're talking about sheets of paper here. But you certainly do yourself no, no uh, favors by looking at stars that are thousands of light years away, because then you, there's no hope. Fortunately, there are stars uh, in the 32.6 to 326 light year um, range that are young. Uh, and there are enough of them that we can build a big sample and do a survey. Um, so first, we need, to know distances, we need to know distances of stars, and we need to know the ages of stars. There's a second reason, which I'll explain in a minute, why nearby stars are better. So this is just showing you an image of a star and a, and a faint thing that might be a planet. And you're, if, you, if this was one astronomical unit, and if you push that star out here, uh, then 
that thing, because the angular separation would decrease, would be buried in this noisy stuff, making your life more difficult. OK, so the basic strategy um, is pretty simple. You find a sample of nearby young stars, nearby and young. Uh, and then there's something called proper motion. And I'm gonna, I have a few, few slides that explains what that is. Um, but you need to have high proper motion. Uh, and then you take an image, uh, preferably with a near-infrared camera. You could do this with a, uh, an optical, uh, a visible light camera, but as long as it's in the red. Young planets are brighter at longer wavelengths of light. So in the infrared, the planets are brighter. So you pick a, pick a camera, and then you use something called adaptive optics, which I'll describe later. Uh, and then when you do that, you'll find that there are a variety of faint things near it. I showed this previous image as an example. Um, here is a, is a young star near the Earth. And you'll see little faint dots like that near a lot of them. And then you go back and you repeat the same thing. You take your image again a year later and look for candidates that have the same proper motion as a star. And uh, so the proper motion is the key thing. Remember I told you that the, we're looking for planets on wide separations that have very long orbital periods, hundreds of years or maybe tens of years, but still quite long. So we can't, we're not going to take images over that long period of time and watch the planet go around the star. That takes too long. We can't use the Doppler technique because uh, we need to see one wobble of the star, which would also take tens to hundreds of years. So we have another way of doing it, and that's uh, uh, where the proper motion comes in. Um, I'm running slow on time. Uh, so big telescopes also help. Uh, so here are the Keck. Uh, telescopes on Mauna Kea. The University of Arizona has access to a beautiful large telescope. These are twin eight meter telescopes. This is the large binocular telescope. Uh, and so both of these, and there's Subaru also with another uh, telescope which has a, uh, a mirror that's uh, roughly the size of one of these. And these are all three large telescopes that participate in imaging planets around other stars. And large telescopes help uh, not so much because of the angular separation. You might say, oh, a bigger telescope helps you resolve things that are very close together. It does help, but even smaller telescopes, the size of the Hubble Space Telescope, can do that. Where the size helps you is by uh, l gathering light from faint things. And you, the star is very bright, but the planet itself is very faint. And so you need to collect a lot of photons, a lot of light from that faint thing. And so the bigger the telescope, the easier that gets. OK, so I'm going to go through the steps. Uh, you've, you've gone out. You, you bought yourself an 8-meter class telescope um, and a fancy infrared camera. And, uh, and you've, you've taken your first image. Here it is. Um, you, you bought the Keck telescopes, so your images look like this, uh, like hexagons, because that telescope is a, the mirrors are built out of segments that are shaped like hexagons rather than a round mirror. It's hexagonally shaped, and so that makes this sort of funny looking uh, image. And so you, taking, you took your first image, and there is a faint dot, and you get excited. Maybe this could be my first one, uh, my first planet that I've imaged. And there is one arc second, and so this is uh, a couple of arc seconds, so roughly the thickness of uh, one sheet of paper again. And you're excited. So how do we determine if this is a real planet? Of course, you're not going to wait. You know, this probably has a an orbit that's 100 years, you're not going to wait for that. Uh, OK, so the next, so this, this is where the proper motion comes in. Um, nearby stars, uh, they move on the sky very tiny amounts every year, uh, uh, thousands of a sheet of paper. The constellations, the Big Dipper, Orion, all of those nice things on the sky didn't look the way they look today. Uh, a million years ago. The stars were in, in different positions. And then a million years from now, they'll look, they'll look different today. And the closer a star is to the Earth, it generally moves a bit faster than ones that are farther away, the perceived motion. They're moving uh, in somewhat random directions uh, in, the, in, in the solar neighborhood. They're all moving around the center of the galaxy, um, but near the Earth, uh, within um, the distances that we, we care about for direct imaging, they're kind of more or less moving in random directions. And so if you look at, uh, so here's a little cartoon. Here you are on the Earth. And this is the star uh, that you took, a, you took that image of. Uh, here you took one image. You're looking at that star. This is the first image. 
And it looks like this. There's a star in the middle, and there's maybe a red thing nearby that got you excited. Maybe that's a planet. And then there's another star off to the left. When you take an image, a uh, uh, picture of a star in the sky with your telescope, you often put the thing of interest in the center. So each next image that you take, uh, you'll recenter it. So you come back a year later and you take another one, and the image looks like this. You centered up this, that young star that's nearby, and it looks like this. Here are the faraway stars. There's the red one and the, and the yellow one. The yellow one is now closer <laughs> to the blue one, and the red one is now on the, on the other side. That already, just those two images, tells you that this blue star is not moving across the sky in the same way as these other more distant stars. So already, if you just blink back and forth between these two images, you'll see that these guys are moving relative to the blue star. If, if, this were, you know, if this thing were really bound to this star, they should move together. And so its position relative to that star shouldn't change. And you've, you, you're in denial, and like, no, 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 like, this can't be, this can't be. And so you take a third one, and now they're over here. Um, and so clearly these stars must be in the background relative to this star. Does that make sense? OK. Now you've taken another image, and this one's golden. So there's a little planet next to star one, and there it sits. You come back uh, a year later, and it's in the same spot relative to the background star. And now you're, you're a little nervous because this is a fantastic discovery. So you want to take another image, a third one, just to confirm even more. And there it is, still in the same place, three years later. Uh, you might even see a little bit of orbital motion if the planet is close to the star. So that's the way you, you in this case, background objects. In this case, you come back and you just look a year later, see if it has the same proper motion. Then you have a, you have a it is extremely unlikely that a background star would move in the same direction at the same rate as a foreground star. The odds of that are very, very, very low. You would be incredibly unlucky. You should not leave the house <laughs> if this happened to you. OK. Now, uh, you still have to be lucky. And these are a bunch of images. Uh, I, I personally have taken hundreds of images with the Keck telescope. And these are some of my favorites. Uh, <laughs> there's a nice one. There's a thing right there. Uh, that's an awesome planet. Here's another one. This is a binary star, which kind of crept in. We usually try to avoid them. Uh, and there's one over there. That's a really exciting planet. Um, you can tell from the sound of my voice, these actually failed the common proper motion test. I went back and looked at images. I took it pictures a year later, and they all moved. This one moved over here. You know, this one probably moved over here. Uh, and uh, it's very disappointing. It's very disappointing because you get excited, and you, you're, up all, you're up all night drinking lots of coffee, and your, your emotions are high, and, and, and then disappointment after disappointment after disappointment <coughs> after disappointment, and so on and so forth. This is why you give this task to postdocs and graduate students, because you don't, <laughs> you don't care about their feelings that much, and you won't see them again. So, OK, but sometimes you get lucky. And so there's that star I showed you uh, in the very first uh, the opening slide, zooming now in to our frog's hair resolution. And there, uh, there you see. Uh, I've added green circles to guide the eye. Um, this is the Keck telescope. Now, it doesn't look like a hexagon, and there's this funny thing in the way. Um, I, won't, I won't delve into that. But the, there's been some clever image processing done uh, on both, both images. But there's a faint dot, and there's another one. Um, this was taken in 2008. There's another image from 2007, a year before, but taken with the Gemini telescope. We're greedy for telescope time, and so we don't just use a Keck telescope, but we use the Gemini, uh, which is two eight-meter telescopes, one in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern hemisphere. And we use, other, we use every telescope we can get our hands on. And uh, if you were to lay this image on top of this one, the dots would be in the same place, almost, very close, but certainly not as far apart as they would be. Uh, this star has a very high proper motion. It scoots across the sky, and in one year, these guys would, if they were backgrounds, would be, uh, this one would be off the screen. Um, so you get lucky. Take these, you know, compare these two, link them back and forth. We use something very similar to uh, in my old boss, Percival Lowell, up in, Fly, up in Flagstaff. Uh, this is a joke. He's long dead. But he, uh, when he discovered Pluto, he was blinking between images and looking for things that move. Uh, here, we blink between images and look for things that don't move. But it's pretty much the same technology. Blink, 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 uh, and you go crazy. 
but sometimes you get really lucky and get excited. So there's two planets. Uh, we were very excited, and uh, um, but we weren't we weren't uh, we weren't done. Some of us wanted to just publish two planets, but a uh, young postdoc and our team, Christian Marois, very, was very really uh, good at image processing. Thought one of these other little nubs in here looked suspicious, and so he. He did a few more things and clever things. And I, I show this movie a lot because it's, uh, it's really fantastic. Um, this is a technique called angular differential imaging, which sounds fancy. Uh, it's quite simple. Um, uh, you, can, you can watch this little movie. It's showing you a bunch of different images, each one uh, that was exposed on the sky for 20 seconds. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, you count it off. And there are hundreds of them. And it's just stepping through each image. And you can see that hexagonal pattern and scattered light from the telescope. And there's the compass, the east and north, is rotating. So the, so the sky appears to rotate in these images. And what happens um, if, you, uh, if you take a picture, let's say this is a star, and this is a planet, P. It's over here on this horizon. It's going to rise and eventually set. When it rises, the star is on top and the planet's on the bottom. When it sets over there, what's the orientation? It's the other way around. So if I'm taking images of it and I don't do anything, my telescope is fixed in a, a base and a, I can move it up and down and I can rotate it, it's going to appear to rotate. When I take my image over here, the, the planet's going to be on the top and the star's going to be on the bottom. When I take an image over here, it's the reversed. Telescopes have fancy things called instrument rotators that correct for that. Sometimes you don't want that to happen, and so the, the whole thing, the base of the telescope can rotate uh, where the instrument st is stuck to the telescope. If you turn that off, then you see images like this. This is a sequence. The pattern you see is produced by residual star, uh, scattered light. Uh, there's an ad adaptive optic system, which I can talk about at the end if you have more questions, that tries to get you to near space-like observing conditions so without the turbulent atmosphere. But there's still residual scattered light from imperfections in your mirror, your optics, uh, instrument properties of your instrument. But over the course of many 20-second exposures, the basic pattern looks the same. It's not changing randomly and in crazy ways. And uh, I'm going to kill the lights a little bit for this, uh, uh, just to make it a little bit easier. And so this is just showing the sky rotation. Of course, we're looking at a tiny spot on the sky. And you might notice there's something whizzing by. There it is. There's another one over there. Those are those two planets that you saw in the previous discovery images, the 07 and the 08. Those are two of them. But now we're, letting, we're taking images and we're letting the sky rotate. And you can see them. And you see sometimes they fall behind these big speckles, what we call speckles, and sometimes they don't. There, this, one, this one over here, you can see it right there. There it is over there. And there's another one. It's very hard to see. I hope you can. You can see that. You've brought your opera glasses. You might have better luck. Um, so if you, if you take one image, one 20-second image, and then take the other, let's say you have 100. You take the other 99. You average those 99. Then the planet that you see there will average out, because it's not in every one of those. It's not in the same position. But what you'll have is a really good reference of what all this scattered light looks like. And if you subtract that from one of the 20-second images, a lot of this stuff will go away. And that's what you see here. Now it's the same movie. Each you're seeing the same frames, but now each frame has had that subtraction happen. Frame one is uh, having, you know, you're subtracting from frame one the average of the other 99. Frame two, you're subtracting the average of the other 99. And now you see it removes a lot of that noise. And you, hopefully you can see this planet and that planet much easier, and there's another one closer in. We don't have continuous coverage. That's why the planets seem to peak, come and go, because um, there's things that happen. When the thing is directly overhead, we, we lose tracking of the of the. Uh, this star is the star, I call it the star that keeps on giving. And it was sort of seemed to be planted there for us, because it, it goes right overhead uh, the Keck telescopes, which means you get maximum rotation. If it's close to the, you know, you know your uh, north or south horizon, then you don't get as much rotation. Uh, and so now, if you take all of these images and then derotate them so that north is pointed up and stack them 
together, then you'll build, uh, you'll keep adding planet photons. Each, take each 20 second exposure, add it to the next one. You'll build up the brightness of the planet in a, in a, and create a very long exposure. And that's what's shown here. You're adding each one of the images. And you can see, and now notice that the north and east are not moving anymore. We've now corrected for the rotation. And you can see the brightness of each planet grows. That's, you know, now we're meaning we're making a better record of what the brightness of the planets are relative to the background noise. And notice, how many planets can you find here? The previous discovery images showed two very easily. How many do you find? Three. Three. Uh, three is what we found, and that's what we published and uh, graced the cover of Science Magazine on my birthday. That was a coincidence. <laughs> um, but Christian Marois still wasn't satisfied, and so you might notice this process actually reveals a fourth one. It's right here, right there. So we had to publish a second paper a few years later because we, uh, we didn't have the fourth one right away. And, and we bet him many bottles of expensive wine, which he has yet to cash in on, that that, that, that really wasn't real. But uh, we, we've done the same exercise at many different wavelengths of light. We still find a planet there um, every time. So four planets. And that basically, the final one of these is that image I showed in the second slide, but all prettied up for the cover of Science Magazine, the different colors and so forth. So um, a number of planets have been imaged. This is just shows a, my favorites. I'm biased. There are uh, half a dozen others that uh, look just as good. Uh, here's the, the one um, from the previous one. There's Christian. You know, we had our 2008, 2010 images. Fomalhaut, uh, this is, uh, shows the disk around a star. It's been blocked out. Uh, this was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, actually. Uh, so not a, not a big telescope, but being in space helps a lot. And there's a faint dot. The, this planet uh, may not actually be a planet. It's very curious uh, what its nature is. And in more detailed observations show that it, it might actually be an extended object and might be a cloud of a protoplanet collision or something even more fascinating, frankly, in my opinion, even more fascinating than finding yet another planet. Um, uh, here's Beta Pictoris, uh, which is visible easily from in the southern hemisphere. There's the planet in two different locations. Now, this one is very close to its star and has a very short orbital period. And so you, uh, in the course of a couple of years, you'll see it move to a different place. The proper motion of the star is quite high, so it's not moving, in, it's not in any danger of being rejected for that reason. In fact, this one is seen, you can see the disk of the star here, um, and then there's been some clever reduction, and uh, this image has been manipulated a little bit for PR reasons. Um, but there's the planet in two different locations, and based on its orbital properties, we think there's a a non-negligible -neglig chance that this might also be a transiting system, meaning that in a few years from now, we might see the planet pass in front of the star and see the starlight drop a little bit, which would be phenomenal because that would tell us also its size, which is something we don't get easily uh, from this technique. Here's another one that orbits actually a thing that's not a star but a brown dwarf, and so this one doesn't get as much attention as it should. And then there's another one here, but they're all very beautiful, um, and there are roughly a, a dozen or so uh, Good candidates. OK. So once you've directly imaged one now, and you're able to separate the planet light from the starlight, that opens the door for a lot of other techniques. Uh, things like spectroscopy uh, is something that I, that I work on a lot. And this shows a, an image, uh, unprocessed image. I'm going to skip along to another one. Uh, and uh, the same star as Keck telescope now, but a different instrument. And, in, and this is you know, none of that fancy processing I showed before. It's a single image. Inside that red box is our, one of our planets, uh, one of those four planets. And this box here, this is the same red box. Um, and there are a bunch of little uh, lenses that were used to disperse, uh, to focus the light on a, onto a, a piece of a spectrograph that disperses the light so that we can measure the brightness in different colors at every one of these uh, spatial locations. They're roughly 16 across and 64 down. And the size of each one of those is 0.02 arc seconds. So here we're resolving, or spatially resolving, uh, light on the sky uh, uh, many, uh, many tenths of a sheet of paper as thickness. Um, 
It's, it's quite remarkable. And what you're seeing here uh, is not a movie in time, but a movie in wavelength. You probably saw this little number stepping across here. These are different, different wavelengths of light, different colors of light in the infrared. And you're seeing what the image looks like. And you notice there seems to be these blobs of you know, ghost-like marshmallowy things moving to the left. And that is because at different wavelengths of light, this image of the star looks different. It actually grows as you go to longer wavelengths. The scattered light is different. But you might notice that one of the blobs doesn't move. Do you notice that? It made it easy on you. I put it in the middle. The planet is here. Planets don't behave like scattered light, and so they don't move in position across the sky with wavelength. And so we can use other clever techniques to, to remove this scattered light, and we've done that. And this is just a before and after for this uh, particular planet. This is planet B, the one farthest away, so farthest away from a lot of the scattered light. And you can see this is a single frame. There, we have many of these that we stack together and reduce the noise, but you can see the planet there. And we do a pretty good job. There's still some residuals. Now for C, which is much closer to the star, it's really nasty. Uh, there you see it's on the other side, so the speckles are moving the other direction now with wavelength, not time, just wavelength of light. And you can see also the planet remains the same. And we can do clever things with that and remove the light, which we did uh, last year. And this is uh, something I'm, I'm particularly proud of. There's planet C in that image. And the black line uh, is a piece of the spectrum of that planet. This is wavelength of light, the ones we were stepping through in the movies, uh, 2.26 microns. And these are wavelengths of light that you can't see with your eye. And this is brightness. And there are three different cases. Just focus on the, on the middle panel here. And you see all these little bumps in there. Each one of those bumps is due to absorption in the planet's atmosphere from things like water, carbon monoxide. This show, I'm showing where the positions of, of strong absorption would happen from methane, water, and CO. And we actually didn't see any methane in this planet, um, but we do see lots of little bumps that line up perfectly with carbon monoxide and water. And this is remarkable um, to resolve individual absorption features in an exoplanet uh, had not been done before. And you can do it because you've gone through that painstaking process of separating planet light from starlight, opening up that possibility. And so this can tell us about the composition of the planet, which we might tie back to the formation processes of planets at very young ages. And I'm currently uh, almost done with this nice spectrum of planet B. OK, so I just have a few slides left. Uh, I want to talk to you a, a little bit about uh, the future uh, of direct imaging. And the future is now. Uh, it's happening now. Uh, on the Gemini telescope, uh, there's a campaign that just started uh, last month, uh, 900 hours of telescope time. So telescope time on, on eight meter class um, facilities like Gemini uh, doesn't come easily. Uh, usually you get a few hours uh, here and there for projects. To get 900 shows, uh, shows that the community of astronomers and, and funding agencies are very interested in taking more images of planets like the one I showed you and spectroscopy. So uh, a team uh, led by Bruce McIntosh and, uh, and also James Graham uh, have built um, something called the Gemini Planet Imager, which is a very special tool designed specifically to image planets close to the star. The previous images I showed you were taken with a camera that was built uh, before the first exoplanet was found. So it wasn't designed with this in mind at all. So with, with um, um, careful uh, engineering, you can create something that's perfectly suited for this. And that's the Gemini Planet Imager. And we have the survey. Here are the cast of characters. Um, uh, there is the truck. There's the Gemini telescope in the background, the dome. On the truck, uh, delivery, uh, these different boxes are pieces of the instrument. This is about the size of a human being, the height of it. Uh, and it will be mounted on the, the business end of the telescope. This just shows you different pieces of it. Uh, there's a, the red part is a spectrograph. Uh, the black base is this adaptive optics thing, which, which I can talk more about later if you want. And then there's this other thing called a Cal system, which does a lot of calibration stuff that's necessary. Um, so that's on the telescope. There are uh, the instrument science team. I'm primarily a theorist, uh, so they don't want me anywhere near this thing until they've 
worked out all the kinks and made sure everything's tight and all the cables are you know, free, I won't trip on one or something like that. So these guys are the ones that are really doing all the hard work right now. Uh, there's Bruce McIntosh uh, in the front. And there's the telescope. They're getting ready. This is day one. The instrument's on. They look serious. They're ready to go. That night, this is what the <laughs> goofy guys looked like. They took a bunch of images like that. They're really trying to get Bruce off the ground, but he's not much of a jumper. He's really great at building instruments, but apparently not destined to play basketball. So this guy, though, there's Christian Marois. He could be a basketball player. Uh, he's very excited, hoping to find more planets. Uh, anyway, we got first light. Instrument's working perfectly. Uh, well, not quite perfectly, but about as good as you could expect for the first few days. We already have some data. Uh, so the initial images were taken of stars that we knew had planets already, like Beta Pictoris. And here's an image stepping through a wavelength. It's like the one I showed you before. Uh, so this uh, instrument can take a spectrum uh, of the sky in a much bigger field of view than the previous one I showed you. And there you can see the planet growing in brightness and then decreasing in brightness. These other spots are not planets or background stars. They're artificially induced spots that provide a reference for brightness and also calibration of, uh, of um, wavelengths of light. So we artificially induce those in the instrument to give us a reference point. And now this uh, inner region is very small. It's about a tenth of the um, distance between the inner planet uh, around HR8799, um, the inner angle. And so we can, with this, we can observe, uh, look for planets at much closer separations than previous. There's HR8799 again, uh, showing uh, some of its planets with the instrument. And I'll finish with this uh, other kind of uh, cartoon slide, and then I'll uh, save time for questions. Um, so this is maybe the future of direct imaging from space. This is uh, something called a star shade. There's actually one of these things. Uh, it's quite big. Uh, it's in a lab. I, I think it's a JPL. Um, and what they want to do is uh, launch this thing into space along with a spacecraft and line it up with stars they think might have Earth-like planets and directly image, say, an Earth or a Jupiter or another star. So they have to perfectly align this giant shade in space with their star, perfectly align the distance of the telescope. And the engineers think this is doable. This is give them a, give them a few billion dollars, and they'll make it happen. Um, and they, they already have one of these prototypes. Uh, and so this is a sort of on a 10-year time scale. And something like this could provide an image of an Earth analog around another star. Now, you wouldn't resolve continents or <coughs> things like that, but you'd at least be able to separate its light from the starlight, and then look for its composition through spectroscopy, for example, uh, and see if it has you know, signatures of uh, biology, um, like oxygen or something like that. Anyway, I'll uh, stop there and answer any questions. <coughs> And let's see, do we have a, another microphone here? Here it comes. Here it comes. <coughs> okay. Somebody over here had a hand up? Yeah, point of, uh, just for my clarification, you left out A, you've got B, C, D, and E. I'm just kind of curious what happened to A and what is it? Oh, right, yeah, I should, I always forget to, to mention that, and someone always asks me. So when we find planets, uh, we always start with B. And this is to avoid confusion with A, which is always the star itself. And so we, we name them um, B, C, D, and E in order of discovery, um, not in order of separation, uh, but in order of discovery. If you have found four of them simultaneously, then you'd rank them in, in order of uh, separation. So B, would, and it's always a lowercase b, uh, lowercase letters for the planet's names. Star name and then, and then the alphabet. Question? I was wondering, what's the difference between a s extrasolar and exoplanet? Excellent question. Uh, they're the same thing, extrasolar planets. Exoplanet is just sort of shorthand for extrasolar planets. So, so planets around another star outside of our own solar system. Follow-up question. What do you call a planet without a star? A free-floating planet. 
We were very clever with our names. And those are possible. For example, we've actually looked for uh, free floating planets, ones that are not bound to that uh, star that had four planets. It's possible that it could have had a fifth or a sixth planet, but because of interactions with the other planet's gravity, it could have ejected smaller ones. Somewhat similar to how comets are uh, distributed in our Oort cloud. They were scattered out into the, these uh, greater distances by the other giant planets. It's possible that these planets around that HR 879 could have ejected one. And then it would have had a different proper motion, but still smaller than the star's proper motion. So we actually looked for a free-floating planet around, uh, around that star, and we didn't find one. And there are other, in, um, uh, in the Orion Nebula, there are some objects that are of planetary mass but don't orbit stars. And those are sometimes called free-floating planets. OK, other questions? Uh, up in the back. Thank you. I appreciate your presentation. A number of years ago in the same auditorium, I heard an astrobiologist su suggest that they were looking for blue planets uh, to indicate similar life structures that are present on Earth. And I appreciated that you spotted water, or, uh, you know, felt that water was on one of those planets. But is there a way for you to look for blue planets? Um, so I should clarify, uh, thank you for your question. So in these planets, these planets are again um, massive planets, so more massive than Jupiter in this case. Uh, they're actually between five and 10 Jupiter masses and I didn't go into how we inferred that. So giant, large giant planets uh, form in a different way than the terrestrial planets and uh, don't have solid surfaces. And so um, water on these planets doesn't indicate uh, um, uh, biologic activity or any of that sort on these particular planets. They're also much hotter. The younger planets are hotter. So these things are close to 1,000 Kelvin, so quite hot. And so, but water is a common molecule. Um, oxygen likes to bond with uh, hydrogen and form, form water. And we see it even in stars. Uh, even in the sunspots on the sun, you can see water absorption in the spectrum of those. And so water is quite common in a variety of things. And so it doesn't indicate life in this case. Now, the question about a pale blue dot or a blue uh, planet, um, can we image those? We, we can't really do that now. But something like the starshade is designed to meet the, go you know, the requirements to do something like that. Um, uh, it's still quite challenging even for something like this. But, but that's, that's the goal for, for some uh, projects, including this one. So we're not there yet. Uh, right there, and then. Excellent question. Um, so, uh, oh, geez, that's complicated. Uh, so, um, a couple of there's a couple of uh, reasons. One is um, if you put it inside the spacecraft, then that limits some of your capabilities in terms of separation of the spot and the uh, actual camera that's taking your image. And if you can put it far away, and, and it, the, the shape of it, uh, these petals aren't there for, for um, beauty. Uh, they're actually there to very carefully uh, shape how the starlight, the scattered light, behaves on the, um, on the camera. And so um, the separation and the shape of the star shade are very crucial to getting the angular separation and the brightness contrast that you really want. And so it's outside of the spacecraft uh, partly for that reason. And they also want to um, have the option uh, in this case, or maybe it's a, a byproduct, but the lifetime of this spacecraft might be short. The star shade will live forever. Um, and so you could launch a different spacecraft later that has different capabilities. Um, this spacecraft would be quite inexpensive relative to the total project. Maybe you, you, you wanted to add something about that? Or? OK. Yeah, it's, it's very complicated. The, if you know something about Fourier transforms or optics, then, then this starts to make more sense to you. <laughs> um, but it is quite complicated. Um, yes, sir. Oh. 
Uh, it's called a coronagraph uh, from the old days when people would make spots so they could image the corona of the sun. Um, and it's essentially doing the same thing that when you, you want to see a plane uh, that's flying near the sun, you put your hand up to block out the sun. It's doing the, uh, a, compar a comparable thing, but it's also uh, carefully uh, shaping the way in which the light uh, enters the telescope. And it's, uh, it's very complicated, and uh, it would take me a while to come up with actually a good way to explain it. <laughs> it's, you know, there, there's some very smart people that think in a mathematical way um, that I don't. Uh, and so it's, it's complicated. Um, I can talk to you offline a little bit about it, and I can explain some of how that works, uh, my, my limited knowledge of it. Other questions? Up here. Oh, <laughs> Oprah would never hire me. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, planets that you're looking at, uh, what are those represented? Are those only the Milky Way galaxy? Well, I'm only looking at stars in the Milky Way, exactly. So only stars. Uh, we need to have stars that are relatively near the Earth to have the projected separation of the planet uh, and star. So again, this is like looking at trees very nearby. I can easily see that they're separate trees. But if you put them you know, uh, 10 trillion miles away, you would not be able to see that they're two trees. You would just see a blob. And so um, you know, a light year is 10 trillion miles. And so I'm restricting myself to uh, several hundred light years. So still quite far away, but still small relative to the size of the galaxy. Now, your question about the Milky Way, um, maybe, impl you know, maybe you're asking, are the stars actually in the band that we call the Milky Way on the sky? That actually um, does matter a little bit. Um, if you could find young stars that are near the Earth that are away from that band of the Milky Way, then the probability of having a background star uh, line up with your, with your actual star that you care about uh, goes down. If you look through the plane of the galaxy, then of course you're looking through the densest star field. And so every star you look at um, with one of these things will have some kind of, you know, uh, potential companion next to it. And so, which is annoying if you have a lot of them. And you have to follow them up, right? So you have to look, look at them again next year. So if you could get enough stars away from the plane of the Milky Way, then the probability of having uh, that chance alignment goes down. But we don't actually care about that anymore. When you look at uh, stars very closely with something like the Gemini Planet Imager, so you're looking at um, a very narrow annulus around the star. Um, and that limited field of view that's been tuned to, to, tuned to be uh, the separation you would expect on the sky for things like Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, and Saturn for stars uh, 10 to a few hundred light years away, that that region has been dialed in specifically for that because that's what we want to image. The probability of finding a background star in that is like 1 in 30 or 1 in 40. And so we actually um, don't expect a heavy contamination, even for stars that are in the plane of the galaxy. So in terms of the, uh, the number of planets, um, what is the current projection as to um, the percentage of planets, or percentage of stars that have planets. Okay, so from Kepler, uh, we learned that essentially every star has a planet with an orbital period of 100 days or less. Um, roughly, you know, on average, they looked at you know thousands of planets, and uh, and that's the that's the outcome, which is amazing. It doesn't say um, anything about planets at longer periods greater than 100 days. Uh, that, the radial velocity survey has found planets on periods that, that, come that exceed just slightly the period of Jupiter, which is uh, of order 10 years, because astronomers have been doing radial velocity surveys for uh, a couple of decades now. And so you can project, you can actually use the radial velocity survey for giant planets and project what you would see uh, with direct imaging techniques. So out in that far right-hand side of that diagram, which was planet mass and separation, and that one, if you use those, of course, you want to know that. That's the question you want to answer. So you're, you're pretending that you already know that answer to make these predictions. But it could very well be, turn out to be something different. Maybe planet formation just peters out at those separations, and we're just lucky to have giant planets. 
that's probably unlikely. Uh, or it could turn out that, boy, planet formation is really efficient at making giant planets at wide separations, and, uh, and you end up with you know, lots and lots of giant planets, five, six, seven Jupiters, rather than just one Jupiter. So we don't know the answer. But if you, if you extrapolate from what we do know from the different surveys, the survey that we, we expect to find a couple of dozen giant planets um, in the three or 400 stars we're going to look at. So we have a, young stars are not easy to find, especially with all the other constraints. So they need to be near the Earth uh, and so forth. And so we don't have a huge sample. And it's taken decades to actually build that sample of young stars. Most of the stars around us are, are old. And so we don't have hundreds of thousands of stars to look at. Yeah, where is the Gemini planet imager located at, and is there more than one of them? Also, if we were looking at our own solar system, what would we actually be able to see with this uh, method? Okay, excellent questions. So the Gemini, the, the Gemini, uh, Gemini Observatory has two twin telescopes, one on Mauna Kea in Hawaii and one in Chile in South America. And so the Gemini planet imager is mounted on the telescope in Chile. Um, so to answer that, I think that's the first question. Um, and what would, uh, could it see uh, our uh, solar system? Let's say, for example, um, aliens uh, 10, 100 light years from Earth have built the same thing. They had the same telescope and the same instrument, and they were looking at us. Would they be able to see us? The answer is no, because Jupiter is very uh, faint. Uh, remember, it's, bil it's billion times fainter than the, than the sun, and that if we were to now, could they see our solar system when uh, it was 10 million years old? The answer to that question is yes. But could it see the solar system now after Jupiter has cooled off so much? The answer is no. But that's for a certain distance. If it were, you know, 20,000 light years away from, from these aliens, then, then no, not with the Gemini planet imager. If it were within 10 to 100 parsecs or... Um, Three or hundred light years or so, then then yes. Great question. I think we'll just take one more. So what you're telling us is we need to zoom in and enhance that. We need to zoom in and enhance that exactly. Um, and so things like the star shade concept or putting a, a a Gemini planet imager type instrument in space could also help. Um, there are a wide variety of uh, uh, methods for canceling out starlight. If you've all used uh, noise-canceling headphones uh, on airplanes, for example, that, drum, uh, that, that create a sound that's just out of phase of all that ambient noise, you can do something similar to that with light uh, using multiple telescopes over large baselines and create nulling effects. So you could put something like that, a noise-canceling type of telescope, in space and cancel out starlight and not planet light and maybe zoom in just like you want to do. So how small of planets can we currently see? So the smallest planets that we could probably image right now with things like the Gemini Planet Imager, and there's also a competing one, which I always hate to mention, by the Europeans. The evil Europeans have one actually on a telescope not far from ours called Sphere. Um, so Sphere and GPI, Gemini Planet Imager, are the two most sensitive ones right now. And they could find something like a Uranus or Neptune mass planet, but again, it has to be very young and still bright. But they could see something like that. But not a Venus or Earth or a Mercury or anything like that. Okay, well, let's uh, thank Travis one more time.